I was diagnosed with ADD. And I read that you were also diagnosed with depression. I don't want to be here. I'm a community college dropout. I was just trying to sell stuff on eBay. And How do yeah. you figure out your way or is it just destined to fail? I mean, I grew up in the suburbs, like middle class. I didn't know that I was entrepreneurial until I don't have the time to put on a show. I don't have the time to pretend I'm more successful than I am. I need to work. I think everybody finds themselves there when there's hardship and we have to keep going. I think it's a privilege to disappear and there were times where I wanted to do that but I also have a lot to offer and I know that I can make a huge impact. What hurt you the most? Mm -hmm. Definitely the public scrutiny because nobody knows what actually happens. Nobody actually knows who I am. Nobody knew the company's valuation. Nobody knew Hey everyone, it's Jacob here, and I'm very excited for today's conversation with Sofia Amoroso, the founder of Nasty Gal. She's also a best-selling author of a book called Girl Boss. She also has lots of other exciting ventures she's involved in, including something called Trust Fund and Business Class, which we will talk about a little bit in this show as well. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk to Sophia is because she has a fascinating story, just in general, not just even from the business perspective, just her life in general. She's gone through a lot of ups, a lot of downs. She created a very, very successful business. She went from being someone who was dumpster diving to and being caught uh, stealing and shoplifting to somebody who created a company that was worth well over $300 million dollars to somebody who had that company go bankrupt to then starting another company. So she, lots of ups and downs, a really fantastic and amazing story that shows tremendous resiliency, um, tremendous ability to move forward. If you subscribe to this podcast on Apple, uh, you will also get a bonus episode where Sophia talks about um, vulnerability and how she has used it as actually a very powerful leadership and learning hack for herself. And we also touch a little bit more on resiliency as well. It's really a fantastic bonus episode. You won't want to miss it. Only available to subscribers on Apple. And with that being said, let's jump into this conversation with Sophia Amoroso. Enjoy. I found your story very fascinating. Uh, it reads like a movie, which I know, obviously, ironically enough, you had a Netflix series turned <laughs> turned after yeah. you. But I thought we could get started kind of way back in the day, because I read that you were raised in a Greek Orthodox church. Uh, you had your first job at Subway. You, as, as a, a very young person, were doing dumpster diving. You were stealing things. You got caught shoplifting. So take us back to the very, very, <laughs> the, the early days of Sophia. Yeah. And what was life like and how did it progress from there? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I grew up in the suburbs, like middle class. You know, my parents, my dad did loans for, you know, track homes and my mom sold them. She was like working in the model homes on weekends. And I mean, only child, I was always just kind of an angsty kid. Um, I never really loved authority and even in high school, I was like, there's a bell ringing and I have to walk from <laughs> one room to the next each hour, every time a bell rings and sit in a desk. Like, what am I being trained for? Yeah. So it was like very angsty and that's, you know, the traditional learning environment really wasn't for me. And it's cool that there's so many other options out there based on how people learn, but there weren't those for me. So hmm. in high school, I... Um, decided to uh, do homeschool for the second half and moved out when I was 17. And I was actually going to anarchist book fairs in San Francisco in high school. And anarchist book fairs? Just like, was like, I want to, mm -hmm. Oh man. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's anarchist bookstores and stuff. There's one on hate street. Um, and then you know, I was like, I don't want to work. I don't, I can live on the scraps of capitalism. There's so much waste. And I uh, just decided to kind of do as little as possible and had a lot of odd jobs. You know, the first one was at Subway. I worked at a Borders Books. That was in high school, but then it was like, you know, photo apps and record stores and shoe stores. Um, and my last job, I, mean, I worked at like a Sharky's Mexican restaurant and Dexter Shoes. And I mean, it's like so many like small, weird retail jobs. 
And my last job was working in the lobby of an art school in San Francisco called the Academy of Art University. And I think I was paid, I don't know what, $12 an hour, which was kind of a lot at the time. So this is 2006, 2006. And my job is a campus safety host. Uh, so I was just standing, sitting, standing, mostly standing in the lobby, checking students in, asking for their IDs and telling them they needed to sign in and go to the second floor for admissions. Uh, and that was my last job. I had done a bunch of stupid stuff before then. Um, I, the first stuff I sold on the internet was books that I stole from borders and sold on Amazon. Um, you know, I learned the hard way that when you break the law, you end up in the hands of other people and stuck with authority. So it was like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, uh, once I got caught stealing finally, and this was like, I was like 18, 19. Um, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna be legitimate, but I'm not gonna like work as hard as possible. My idea of work was, you know, have a job where the delta between, you know, what I'm being paid and the effort I have to make is as as big as possible. So standing in a lobby kind of seemed like a fit. Um, and while I was there, started getting requests on MySpace from eBay sellers. And, you know, that's the next part of the story. But uh, wasn't I didn't know that I was entrepreneurial until, you know, something I found something that I was curious about. Mm and ready to learn and just go down that rabbit hole. It's funny, you you mentioned something uh, that I thought was very interesting, and that was when you were in school and you had to go from classroom to classroom when a bell rang and sit at a desk and you were thinking like, what what is that going to be preparing me for? And I guess now in today's corporate environment, we know exactly what that's preparing people for is to be, uh, for the most part, drones who, uh, you know, order takers and whatnot. Um, so clearly that didn't resonate with you or with me for that matter and many, many other people. But thankfully, I think we've been doing a little bit better in the corporate world. It's it's getting, <laughs> making some progress over the years. For sure, um, yeah, absolutely. And I read that you were also diagnosed with depression, ADHD. I was also diagnosed with ADHD when I was much younger and uh, I was put on Ritalin for a while and... Later, I realized that ADHD could actually be kind of a superpower for me because when I find something that I either really like or I'm in the middle of doing, I could really focus on that thing, but it had to be something that really captured my attention. And so for me, I always viewed ADHD as kind of like a magnifying glass. And when you point it at the right thing, you could just laser zoom in on it. Otherwise, I would just be going crazy. Did you find that to be kind of a superpower for you, something that a lot of people thought was a weakness that you were able to leverage? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was diagnosed with ADD in high school and was just like, no, actually, this just isn't the environment for me. I was diagnosed with depression in high school. And I was like, well, look around, you know, I don't want to be here. Yeah, This isn't, if I don't want to be here, of course, I'm going to be bummed. But it turns out that I actually do struggle with depression. And it wasn't a situational thing. And that's something that I've worked through, you know, my whole life. Um, and then with ADD, I do think it has helped me. I think like I can be really, really focused at times, but it, it is tough because I do get distracted. And now with the amount of browser tabs that, you know, yeah. we can have open, it's just like primed for ADD. I think there's like a little bit of like a manic curiosity and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm on the spectrum per se, but for me, it's a little bit more of a like obsessive. I, I'm so curious. I will spend all my time on this, yeah. immerse myself in it, learn everything there is to learn about it and reverse engineer everything everyone else has done and just do it differently and often better. Um, and that's, you know, I don't know if I can attribute ADD to that, but I do know that ADD to a certain extent allows me to make asymmetrical connections between things that other people wouldn't. Mm. Um, and so those browser tabs end up in folders together that there are sometimes unrelated, but still really valuable and kind of a little bit radical sometimes in their pairings. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Sometimes there is a kind of logic in the chaos, so to speak. And I, and I find very much, 
that I work in the same way. I, I, you get a lot of browser tabs and sometimes they're organized in strange ways. And mm -hmm. then you look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Uh, so, so take us to the launch of Nasty Gal because this ended up becoming this huge, huge organization. It was worth, what, what was it worth at the peak? It was hundreds of millions of dollars, right? It was worth $350 million. $350. So I bootstrapped Nasty Gal. Yeah, I started as an eBay store. First year was... 75k i was 22 second year was 250k third year was six and a half and then it was 12 and that was profitably no debt no investors no family money just flipping clothes because i thought business was selling things for more than you bought them for and not send you know spending all the money yeah. no one would have given me money that was just the math i understood um and eventually in 2012 uh, venture capitalist came in and invested $60 million and valued the company at 350 and I owned 80% of it. Wow. Uh, so on paper I was worth a ton of money. Um, yeah. Ultimately we built the company to over a hundred million dollars in revenue. Did you know that 96% of the people who watch videos on this channel are not subscribed? That's pretty crazy, right? Make sure that you hit subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can get notified when more videos just like this one are released. What what happened from there? Because I understand and from, from what I read, from what I saw, uh, it seemed like everything was going great, everything was on the up and up, and then some kind of challenges, some roadblocks started to come your way. And this is where I thought a lot of people who are listening to this would learn a lot from your experiences, the importance of being resilient. Uh, especially when they're growing, trying to create new products and services, leading teams. What ended up kind of changing the trajectory of the company? Because it seemed like everything was going amazingly well, and then all of a sudden problems started to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll just, to start, it, you know, I'm a community college dropout from Sacramento. Should the, This chance of me having built a business that large is really, really slim. I was a super young founder. I wasn't trying to build a startup. I was just trying to sell stuff on eBay and followed my nose and got really good at it. And um, and went from there. It was called Nasty Gal. So I guess establishing just for the people listening, it was called Nasty Gal. Um, it started with eBay, uh, vintage clothing on eBay, and then eventually built my own site at nastygal.com. And we had our own designs and we curated from the market and it, and it got very, very big. People were obsessed with it. In 2014, I read a book about it called Girl Boss. It spent 18 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It sold half a million copies and it put me on a map in a way that was beyond even the whole entrepreneur story that had happened where I was on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine and, you know, years before the book came out. So I was this kind of poster child. And so when I, you know, before I get into the hard part, um, I think it's important to establish that there was this insane amount of hype. You know, we hired a hundred people in a year. Um, they were so stoked to work at the company. Um, you know, I was this whatever golden child, uh, female entrepreneur of which there were very few. I had written this book and inspired a lot of people and kind of got handed a responsibility that I didn't quite sign up for. But of course, as the CEO or leader, you sign up for kind of whatever happens. I didn't know what would happen. I, you know, so, you know, hiring a hundred people in a year, it's like the tower of Babel. Yeah. I don't know how companies do that and integrate their teams. So for us, it was, yes, very exciting. You know, we were, there were, you know, champagne clinks every day for some different milestone, but also people were joining the company and we didn't have processes in place. And eventually there was, you know, politics and fiefdoms and silos and cattiness and one team's culture was great and another team's culture was different. So every team had a different experience of what culture was in the company. And I never set a culture. We, we said some words like, no assholes and like whatever work hard stuff like that but it was like on the wall and it wasn't something that we think um had discipline about instituting as much as we could yeah. have i never worked in an office or managed anybody when i started this company i also had never experienced leadership leadership was management and it was hey clock in can you do this differently? Well, that was literally the leadership I had experienced. And as someone who started a company, 
uh, and did whatever needed to happen and held myself accountable, I thought that these C-level executives that I hired would show up, diagnose what needed to happen in the business and do what needed to happen and hold themselves accountable. I didn't know that grownups whose careers were longer than my entire lifespan needed to be told, you know, Hey, did you, Hey, did you actually do the thing you said you were going to do? Um, I didn't understand that people needed to be inspired. I, they were inspired, but you know, I didn't have, I just didn't even have, I didn't have the empathy because I didn't have that same need and I had never really had a model for what leadership looked like. Mm. So I was just feeling my way around in the dark yeah. and it was, you know, finding the gaps eventually in what wasn't happening. Um, that was really interesting. And I learned the most about leadership from what I found out I wasn't doing. So Nasty Gal was on this amazing trajectory. We built the company to over hundred million dollars in revenue. Ultimately we were, overpriced and we had spent more money to get to a hundred million that we, than we had anticipated. We were bloated. We, you know, at that time you had to have an engineering team to have an e-commerce site. You, there was no Shopify at the time. There weren't as many three PLs or third party logistics companies that could ha- warehouse and ship your stuff for yeah. you. We had to hire a huge executive at Zappos and open a fulfillment center in Louisville and <laughs> sign a lease for a hundred thousand square feet. So, we were overpriced. We were bloated. Uh, culture wasn't great because we had grown super fast. I didn't know what culture was. Didn't really know how to integrate those people as we hired them. And as you know, growth kind of plateaued. We had a hard time fundraising because we were priced at three hundred and fifty million dollars when maybe even at a hundred million in revenue, super successful. The company might have been worth 200 or 250 million to someone at a private equity firm or a strategic retail, you know, uh, a buyer. So ultimately, it became really hard to fundraise. So we did layoffs. The book was published in early 2014. By the end of 2014, we had laid off. I don't know if it was 15 percent of the staff. I'd never done anything like that before. We lay off the PR team. Like they know who to talk to. So that's part of it. And when you separate people from a company that they're so passionate about working for and are inspired to work for and their identity hinges on the, you know, the fact that they're affiliated with this business, it's not just getting laid off. It's like, oh my God, my identity. Yeah, it's a tough thing my coolness, this, this social capital I get to run around with saying I work at Nasty Gal, all of that is ripped away. I don't get to come to work and have fun here anymore. Um, so that's when there were some, you know, headlines of toxic culture and it, there, it, there, there was some, I didn't know what was happening in different rooms as a leader or especially a CEO. I think I can't really speak for um, leaders of, orgs within a company, you know about 10% of what's happening in your business at any given time, but you're held accountable for a hundred percent of it. Yeah. And that's ultimately, you know, that's, that's just what comes with the territory, but you don't know until people are like, Hey, this is happening. Don't you know about it? And it's like, you must've co-signed on this. And it's like, no, I didn't know that was happening in the room, you know? But it is my responsibility. It's funny. That's an interesting challenge that you make. And it's it's also interesting because a lot of leaders that I talk to, you know, I ask them, have you ever received formal leadership training early on in your career? And a lot of leaders are like, no, we just kind of get thrown into it. And it's like, you hope for the best and, <laughs> you know, see if you can figure it out. So it's interesting that you were put into this position. And I think a lot of leaders can relate to this because for most people who have full-time jobs, when they get promoted in their first leadership role, many of them have no training no experience leading. They're just kind of like, hey, you're good at your job. Now you're managing 20 people. See you later. And you're kind of like, Why? Yeah. I, what do you mean? Are you going to teach me something? Or what do you... So I, I guess looking back at that, what, what do you wish that you would have done? So if you could kind of redo that process, and this is kind of speaking to a lot of leaders out there who are probably in a similar situation in their careers mm-hmm. now, how can you better navigate that leadership um, I don't know, tornado, I guess, if you want to call it, without having somebody guiding you? Like, how do you, how do you figure out your yeah. way or is it just destined to fail? 
I think a lot of people want to go from zero to the top really fast, especially younger workers. They want yeah. inflated titles. They want to be a director or a VP after working at a company for a few years. They don't want to be a manager. You know, they want to go sit on panels. There's a certain amount of kind of, yeah, hierarchy glory that, that people seek. And it's actually a disservice to them to promote them too early and throw them in a position where they're actually not equipped to run that team. And they may even be employing people or managing people who know more about management than they do, but somehow they got promoted into that role and they lose respect and the company loses credibility. I would, I, I really think people should put in the time. I wish I had worked in an organization. I wouldn't have done a good job. I would have been on fire, yeah. <laughs> but I, would have been so much more prepared to at least empathize with or have a model for, even if I wasn't trained for it, to have, to have a model for what leadership looks like. Yeah. So for those people, I would say, go find a great person to report to. And if you're not learning from the person you're reporting to, like you're, you're not, there's not a, you're just getting paid. So you may be learning about your role, but if you want to move up in your career, your job's going to become about people and resource allocation and leadership yeah. and holding people accountable. And you're not even going to be doing the work anymore. You may not even want to do that. Do you want to learn how to create an amazing corporate culture while avoiding the pitfalls that make for a toxic one? If so, I created a brand new eight part training video series just for you. In total, it's around 30 minutes in length and you can get it right now by going to helpmyculture.com. Go there right now before this training series disappears forever. Again, that is helpmyculture.com and get access to this free eight-part training series on how to create an amazing corporate culture. I guess there's still something to be said for, um, and I, I hate using this phrase because somebody told it to me when I was much younger, and it's kind of the, the idea of paying your dues of, uh, you know, climbing that traditional corporate ladder, I guess you could say. So some of that, and it's funny because years ago, I used to be the person who says, you don't need to climb the corporate ladder, the hell with it, like go do your own thing. But it turns out there is some value to going through that process if you are working with and for leaders who can kind of guide you and coach you and mentor you and show you the ropes, because that I think will really help set you up for success. And it sounds like you didn't have that. A lot of leaders inside of organizations don't have that. And so probably the best piece of advice there is find somebody at your company, whether you report to them directly or not, who can guide you and show you the ropes and mentor you. And I think it's a, an important piece of advice for people out there. Uh, you also mentioned culture. And you had 100 people, and some companies out there have hundreds, thousands of people. How, yeah. how do you even create that culture? Because I understand how hard it must be even for 100 people. And yeah. I think sometimes the, the challenge of culture gets lost and it's very easy to say, oh, toxic culture, bad culture, you shouldn't work there. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about the challenge of what, what does culture mean and what is the effort that's required to actually create it in a way so that it you know, connects with people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I learned a lot about this both from doing it wrong and then I did it right in my second company, Girlboss. And it's something that I have a, a digital course for entrepreneurs called Business Class, and there's an entire module on building culture and leadership. It's the last one. Um, and what I learned is that you have to hold yourself accountable to leading yourself with a level of discipline in the kind of culture that you'll want to build, either, whether it's inside your organization or your team, if it's not your business, even if it's a team of one. So even if it's just you, the culture that you lead yourself by is going to be the groundwork, lay the groundwork for the culture that you then employ people and, and model for them. So setting objective guidelines for what culture and success look like in your business from day one gives people something to point to and say, oh, this is it, rather than, well, Sophia said this. Like anything you can make that people think is implicit, making it explicit and saying, I signed on for this, we signed on for this, it's not my opinion your, or your opinion, this is 
this, these are the guiding principles of how we operate. It has to happen with your first employee and you have to hold people accountable to it because performance will drop to the level of the lowest performer. Hmm. If you tolerate that, like what you tolerate in relationships, what you tolerate in the workplace, what you tolerate in your organization is what you're accepting and yeah. it's what you can expect. So, you know, Netflix, I think has great, you know, their, their, you know, guide, their guiding principles are pretty hardcore, but it's like, you know, we're high performers. If this doesn't happen, that's great. We'll pay you to go away. You know, but it's you set the expectations for your team based on who you keep and who you fire and also what the model that you set as a leader. And this goes for even taking time off. So, you know, I thought, oh, my employees might think I'm distracted if I'm on vacation. But if I never take a vacation, they're going to think that that's the culture and that they're not allowed to either. So what you model as a leader is what your team will model after you and you have to hold yourself accountable to that and you have to hold them accountable to that. And sometimes that means making unpopular decisions and removing people from the organization if that's not what they're living up to. Culture also means trying to get people there. Yeah, I've made the mistake of just like whack, whacking people and being like, that's not the culture. But great leaders also help pe get people there and they reinforce that and they course correct. And I've seen really great, really people who are like, oh, wow, you're actually talking to people like that be coached and learn and become great people that everybody loves working with if they're given a chance and they're given that feedback. So how does that course correct actually happen? Is it just a matter of a leader going to one of their employees and saying, hey, I noticed you're doing this? Because to your point, it's easy to just kind of, you know, slap somebody's wrist and say, hey, we don't do that here. That's not our culture. It's another thing to actually get people to move in the direction of that culture. So how do you do that? Uh, and maybe kind of a second part to that question is, what do you do when things get out of hand? Because as you experience the fiefdoms come up, uh, uh, toxicity starts coming in one part of the organization here and there, and all of a sudden it spreads. How do you keep that from happening and course correct if it does? You do it quickly. Uh, because once, once any toxicity or dysfunction permeates a culture, you can't, it's really hard to correct at scale. I would just be like, move your company to New York and lay everybody off. <laughs> Start over. Um, because you can't, you cannot retrofit culture into an organization. You can do it individually and catch something as it comes up and not have HR be a black hole where people go to complain, but have an organization where when something happens, somebody comes to their boss and their boss deals with it. And you know, that's what they're, that's what they're expecting. So for us, HR was just a place where complaints went to die, went to die, unfortunately. Um, so do it quickly, treat people like adults. And I think there are really diplomatic ways of having conversations that are not personal about somebody's performance, whether it's a bad attitude or they're a low performer and saying, I mean, I'm like, what's the script for that? I've, I've employed great leaders who can do things like that. I'm still challenged in terms of getting someone from here to there. I'm a very good zero to one founder, which is why I'm an investor now. And I just want to do that over and over again with yeah. a bunch of companies. But it's sitting down and saying, you know, we're committed to you here. And, you know, when you join, this was, these are the, the principles that guide our organization. And it's really important that we maintain those. You know, this came up, of course, give that person a chance to tell their side of the story and say, OK, I don't really know what happened. But as a reminder, this is this is this is how we operate. And, you know, if you know, I, I want to I want you to be a success here, but this is what's going to have to change. And eventually the conversations when you remove people are things like, you know, it's okay if it's not a fit. It's a double opt-in. It's not personal. Yeah. You know? I think the challenge with, with long, young leaders and founders is that they try to be friends with their teams. And then it's like, you know, oh. some big shock. I think like teams, teams should be teams and not families. It's funny because I'm, and I'm sure you've heard the book. Um, well, I guess it depends who you talk to. There was a book that came out many years ago. Uh, what was it called? The Alliance. And they talked about like tours of duty 
And then there are some leaders I talk to and they're like, oh yeah, it's a family. And they literally use language like, I love my people. And I'm like, really? Do you really love them? Because would you be letting them go if you love them? I, you know, so I, I, I see the direction that you're going in. And that's very interesting because, um, I don't know, do, do you think it's good to be friends with your employees or is it good to have that separation? Because Gallup, I know one of the things they do is um, some study, I think it's every year, and they say that one of the predictors of either engagement or loyalty is, do you have a best friend at work? Mm -hmm. um, I think teammates and peers can have friends at work. I think cronyism is really dangerous. Yeah. I think clickiness is really dangerous. I think leaders need to set uh, boundaries with their teams that they're, you know, whether it's being available during these hours or these are the conversations we have. We keep it light. We don't hang out on weekends. Um, you know, people, I guess, hmm, what was I going to say? I think it's dangerous. And your ultimate responsibility as a leader or a business owner is to protect the larger organization. Yeah. And if you have emotional attachments to people in the company, you may make decisions more slowly than you would if you're objective about how well someone's doing and how that affects the greater success of the business. And if your loyalty is to an individual and you let their low performance persist, it's going to slow the company down. And if your mandate, and it should be as a leader and a business owner, is to do no harm, you're doing harm to the company by not thinking that your responsibility is to the organization above any individual. Mm. It's funny because... Uh, so I'm working on a new book on leading with vulnerability, which is coming out in October. And one of the questions I've been asking a lot of these CEOs is, you know, what makes you feel most vulnerable and why? And one of the most common responses I got back from these CEOs is um, they feel very vulnerable when they hire somebody and they let them stay in their position for too long of a time, even though that they see that this person is coming, causing damage to the company. And they don't do anything about it. And they just mm -hmm. feel like, well, you know, I should give them a chance or I know this person, uh, you know, I, they would never do something to harm the company. And that's been one of the biggest regrets from a lot of these CEOs that I've, uh, that I've interviewed. And I think it's precisely because you mentioned, right, there's some sort of emotional attachment. Um, so how do you balance that? Because we're all human beings in an organization. How do you keep that separation of, you know, we're working together. I care about you as a person. I want to know what's going on in mm -hmm. your life, but like, don't screw up or you're getting the hell out of this company. <laughs> like, how do you, how do you balance that? I mean, just to your point about leaders feeling vulnerable when they let a low performer stick around the organization sometimes, and this is contrary to what I just said, doing harm means removing that person. Yeah. And strategically, being super strategic and understand the implications of taking one piece out of the kind of Jenga, knowing that, you know, understanding that the bigger harm you do by removing that person could be that an entire organization falls apart or just work falls to the ground, or there's no institutional knowledge in the organization that can take the team or the next person who replaces that person um, and keep a level of continuity within the business. Um, so having bench, I think is important, um, and scenario planning and being thoughtful when you remove someone from an organization. Um, if you don't, you know, if, if removing them doesn't put the company at risk, like, you know, yeah. take them out, but, <laughs> um, you know, initially I had old school HR guidance as a young founder and attorney saying things like, don't apologize, don't make it personal. I mean, of course it shouldn't be personal, but don't, you don't say like, I love you. You're like, thank you for your time here. We can no longer, um, unfortunately your role has been eliminated. Here's a piece of paper. You have two weeks. Let us know if you have any questions, this person will see you out. Like that's a layoff and it shouldn't be yeah. a layoff should be, shouldn't be a surprise. Um, and no one should be surprised when they get fired unless it's something super egregious and they're really out of touch with themselves. 
okay, once in a while, and they'll probably sue you. But people revolt when they're not given a heads up that they're not performing well or that the company's not performing well. Yeah. So at Girlboss, we, we did have to make layoffs during COVID, but we said, hey, you know, because we, we had a little bit of a media company. And we said, hey, guys, revenue has gone to hell. We can't put events on. Brands have pulled their dollars. And we have an organization to support. We can't do, do that if we don't have revenue. So we're just going to work as hard as we can as a team to get X amount of revenue in the door, specific. And if we aren't able to do that, unfortunately, that means we can't support our team. Yeah. And so everybody, you know, banded together. We did our best. People were able to think about their next move. We placed people even if, you know, while we were maybe going to hit that number. And ultimately, we didn't hit that number. But when I laid those folks off, I got thank you emails. Like so different, and yeah. instead of toxic headline, toxic culture headlines. Um, yeah, it's human. Yeah, I, I, I don't this, know if that answers. Does that no, answer your question? Yeah, it does. And it, it's funny. It reminds me of um, my wife used to work for a Fortune 100 company, and she was laid off there many, many years ago. And she told me the story about how she and this was a company that was going through layoffs. Uh, you know, there were challenges, and so she just found out about it one day. And and she shows up to the company. It's one of the world's largest technology companies. I'm sure people might be able to figure it out. And she goes in there and the there was a lady who was literally running a meeting. She had a headset on. She had like Zoom open or whatever it was. And she was laying my wife off while she was in this meeting. And it was so impersonal and so inhuman and so like, get the hell out. You're a number it's like your expired milk that's being taken out of the fridge and throwing out in the trash. And it's funny because now when my wife gives talks on customer experience, you know, that's one of the stories that she tells to audiences around the world about how she got laid off and the inhuman experience that it was. And so I like your story that even when you're going through tough times, you can still treat people with dignity and with respect and be kind to them and be human to them, even when things are going tough. And I don't know why that's a hard, such a hard thing for people to do. Like you keep hearing in the news, right, with these layoffs that are happening and whether you look at Elon Musk or, you know, any of these other companies out there, it just seems like they're doing it in a way that is, I don't know, it's almost like cold. <laughs> it's almost like an assassin walking in there with yeah. like a giant samurai sword and just lopping people's heads off. Like that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. Yeah, totally. I mean, people are doing it over Zoom, you know, they're just, it's like, it. people really put a lot into their jobs. Yeah. You know, some people don't, but a lot of people really care about their jobs more than you would ever think. And they they take pride in the work that they're doing and they really do care about the people that they work with and they care about the customer and they care about the product. And if they feel aligned with the mission, if they're removed from the organization without any kind of humanity or gratitude, it's really, it's, it's dehumanizing. Um, and I think that was like an old school kind of, okay, here's layoffs, call everybody into the room yep. kind of thing. And yes, that, that does happen. But I think always leading with gratitude and, you know, you've, you know, I, I just, I mean, we were just talking about layoffs yeah. specifically, but like you've made a huge contribution here. And I'm so grateful for the time that we've been able to spend together. And I've seen you grow so much and... I've learned from you and I, you know, have seen you grow and I'm so excited for your future. Unfortunately, we don't have, yeah. there is no role and the organization is fill in the blank macro conditions, low, you know, company not hitting its numbers, whatever that parts. I mean, the whole thing is objective, but when you're grateful for people and the, heart and soul that they put into their jobs and yeah, treat them like adults, then, you know, you're like, you're, you're protected. Yeah. I think it's an important, when you don't do that, that's when they, that's when they send threats and go to the press. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it seems like you definitely learned a lot during the course of, um, you know, all these different things that you've been involved in. 
You won't want to miss my conversation with Sophia as it continues for subscribers of the show on Apple Podcasts. If you subscribe, you will get ad-free listening, bonus content, and also early access to new episodes. Uh, If you subscribe right now, you'll also get access to this bonus episode with Sophia where we dive a little bit deeper into the subject of resiliency and vulnerability and how she has used that as a very powerful leadership hack which helped her grow and succeed in her career. So how could you possibly not want to subscribe to get access to that episode as well as getting access to episodes every week from my amazing guests most importantly when you subscribe it supports this program the team that comes together to help create this program and it allows me to bring in more amazing guests like sophia so i hope you decide to subscribe and support the show